Trân trọng chào đón quý khán thính giả của Người Việt TV đến với một, một buổi hội thoại đặc biệt của Bích Trâm cùng hai vị khách quý, đó là vị đại sứ Mỹ tại Việt Nam, ông Mark Napper và dân biểu Lou Correa. Chúng tôi xin phép được nói tiếng Anh cùng hai vị khách của chúng ta. Xin mời quý vị có thể theo dõi phần phụ đề tiếng Việt ở trên màn hình nếu cần. Please let me give a very warm welcome to our wonderful Người Việt TV viewers out there. My name is Christina Bicham and today we are honored to um, have two of our very distinguished guests to join us. The U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, Mark Knapper, and Congressman Lou Korea. Ambassador Knapper is a Korea diplomat who served in um, a number of Asian countries including Japan, South Korea. He's been in Vietnam since the beginning of last year. And um, due to his friendship and the connection that he's been able to cultivate with the Vietnamese people, he's often known as the bridge between the U.S. and the Vietnamese people. Congressman Lu Korea is a longtime Orange County resident. He has served Orange County and Little Saigon um, in various capacities um, on the Board of Supervisors of Orange County as well as the California State Assembly. He was elected to the House of Representatives in 2016 and um, in Congress he chairs the Vietnam Caucus focusing on issues that are relevant to the Vietnamese American community. I'd like to start with Mr. Ambassador. As a diplomat and a linguist, you speak a number of languages, Japanese, South, uh, Korean, and Vietnamese. Would you like to say hello to our viewers in Vietnamese and tell us, what is your favorite Vietnamese food? Well, thanks a lot, Christina. Rất là hân hạnh được gặp chị Christina và những người đang nhìn thấy chương trình này. Rất là vinh dự có thể có dịp này để nói chuyện với Christina và nếu phải nói về những món ăn Việt Nam thích nhất là phải nói là và là phở rất là ngon và sau đó cơm tây cũng rất là ngon. Wow. Thì cảm ơn. Good choice. Thank you. Phở is my favorite too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, cơm tâm á. Yeah. Your turn, Congressman. You are already quite familiar with our audience as they are with you. So would you like to greet them and by the way, do you have a favorite restaurant stop in Little Saigon that you can recommend? Christina, xin kim chào quý vị tôi là Lu Korea. I work for you. Christina, thank you for having us today. And your question about my favorite restaurant. Well, first of all, let's establish the fact that the best Vietnamese food in the world is in Little Saigon. Wow. Uh, and so <laughs> I enjoy going to as many restaurants as I can uh, here in Little Saigon and enjoying the wonderful cuisine. Uh, Vietnamese food is the best, but what is most important is to know that this is the best Vietnamese food in the world here in Little Saigon. Wow. And in Thank the best you for Vietnamese that. Vietnamese community in the world. This, isn't this the only Vietnamese community in the world? Yeah, it's the most important one, absolutely. And this is Đỗ Bảo Anh, by the way. Xin kính chào quý vị. So the first question I'd like to pose to um, Mr. Ambassador, following President Biden's trip to Vietnam last month, <clears throat> during which bilateral ties were elevated to the highest level of diplomatic relations, namely Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, or CSP, how does the U.S. see Vietnam as fitting into your overall Indo-Pacific strategy with this new level of partnership and specifically in terms of economic cooperation. How do you see Vietnam as fitting into the semiconductor global supply chain? Well, thanks, Christina. Uh, it's a really terrific question. Hello again uh, to your viewers and your readers and your audience. Um, yes, I mean, with the, with the visit of President Biden uh, last month, September 10th and 11th, uh, to Hanoi, um, we inaugurated a, a brand new chapter in our two countries' ties with this elevation 
uh, to a comprehensive strategic partnership, um, which was about as public and resounding an affirmation as, as we could hope for um, in our two countries' uh, ties. Um, and it represents the full range of cooperative activities between our two countries, everything from trade and investment uh, to discussions about security, defense cooperation, um, science, technology, education, health, climate change, energy, um, discussions about human rights, religious freedom as well. And so, you know, these are all key areas of cooperation and discussion between our two countries. And the focus, um, one of the main focuses, of course, was on trade and investment cooperation, um, cooperation in education, particularly the kind of economic and educational cooperation that um, as you mentioned, uh, high-tech areas like semiconductors, we hope will help elevate um, Vietnam uh, within global supply chains that manufacture the kind of high-tech goods that are essential uh, for the American economy to function. I think as we saw uh, during COVID-19, it's um, unwise uh, for the American economy to be too reliant on a single source of high-tech and other essential products for our manufacturing, for our prosperity. And so the goal is to work with Vietnam uh, as it elevates its own manufacturing capability as it develops its own high-tech and innovation-driven economy, uh, such that the United States can benefit uh, from a Vietnam that is uh, more interlinked globally in high-tech manufacturing, with a Vietnam that is more interlinked with the American economy, and ultimately with a Vietnam that um, can help to promote American prosperity and security, promote prosperity for American businesses, promote prosperity for American manufacturers, American farmers, American ranchers, um, and I think that uh, you know, the Vietnamese American community is particularly well placed uh, to take advantage of this new situation between our two countries in which business opportunities will grow, in which opportunities for investment will expand, and opportunities for investment coming in from Vietnam uh, will also be a significant aspect of our ties, two countries' ties going forward. So um, if I look optimistic about our two countries' relationship, it's because I am, because I think uh, the United States and Vietnam are good for each other's prosperity, we're good for each other's security, ultimately we're good for each other's economic future. And um, just again, very happy to be here today. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Congressman, you get the hard question. Of course. So um, prior to uh, the trip, uh, President Biden's trip to Vietnam, you and um, a number of uh, other um, you had co-signed a bipartisan letter um, advising the president to challenge uh, Vietnam's human rights violations, as well as uh, demand a release of um, prisoners of conscience unconditionally. So now that the trip has wrapped, do you feel that your suggestions have been adequately met by the administration? I would answer it the following way. Um, Vietnam has not done enough to address the issue not only of human rights but also of religious freedom. This is a struggle we've had here for decades. It's nothing new. Um, I was thinking earlier today that uh, when I was in the State Senate my chief of staff, Tammy Tran, went to Vietnam about 2010, 2011 as a private citizen. And um, she's an American citizen, private citizen, uh, was believed just visiting as a tourist, was arrested by the Vietnamese government, uh, held, and then she was deported to Thailand for no reason. Actually, there was a reason. And that's because my office fought hard for human rights and religious freedom. And so clearly that was the reason she was arrested and deported. Uh, I believe those circumstances in Vietnam still exist. And so now that we have the opportunity, the American opportunity to work more with Vietnam, we cannot forget that human rights, religious freedom is an important component of normalizing trade and investment in Vietnam. Who should lead that charge? Little Saigon. The community has to be the one that tells us in government what we need to do. You need to remind us. You need to tell us when there's a prisoner of conscience, somebody arrested, you need to tell us so that we can bring it up to the Vietnamese government for attention. I've never gone to Vietnam, 
and frankly, should I go? Should I not go? Um, I want to go, but at the same time, if I go, it's to deliver a message saying you need to respect human rights, religious freedom. But I don't want to essentially also uh, reward bad behavior. So I look to the Vietnamese community for advice and counsel. Glad to hear that from you. We will take you up on that. Um, Mr. Ambassador, let me follow up on the previous question regarding the U.S. plan for Vietnam to uh, become a manufacturer of semiconductor chips. So um, industry analysts in Vietnam uh, have pointed out that there is a shortage of skilled labor, namely engineers and experts in the chip sector. So is that a concern as well as if there is going to be any technology transfers between the U.S. and Vietnam? Is there a concern that that might fall into the wrong hands, namely China? Well, thanks, Christine. Another really great question. Um, and we do hear from our, our uh, counterparts in the Vietnamese government, but also colleagues in the private sector, uh, particularly American companies that are in high-tech manufacturing, about uh, the need to increase the numbers of IT workers in Vietnam, um, engineers, other high-tech uh, labor. And this is something that, uh, again, emerging from President Biden's visit, was uh, a commitment to work with Vietnam on, on upskilling, reskilling uh, workers, workforce development, uh, to create the kind of um, ecosystem uh, necessary to host and take advantage of the opportunities, the manufacturing opportunities of the 21st century. Again, this is going to benefit American businesses that are seeking to invest in Vietnam. Um, this is going to benefit American consumers. Um, ultimately, this will benefit the American economy and, and benefit American prosperity going forward because the more that the United States is able to enjoy access to supply chains, diverse and high-tech supply chains um, in a place like Vietnam, and this is not just manufacturing, but things like <coughs> critical minerals, of which Vietnam will increasingly be a, a source, uh, I think the more secure and the more stable America's high-tech economic future will be, will be protected. Um, as for IP protections, certainly uh, we are, we the U.S. government, the U.S. Embassy are very vigilant about ensuring that um, American technology, American intellectual property are protected um, and that um, companies and countries with whom we do business um, apply the highest standards of protection of, of these uh, hard-fought, hard-developed, expensively developed technologies do not fall into the wrong hands, into the hands of our competitors. And this is something we, we have very close conversations with the government of Vietnam about. And so far, um, you know, we believe, and our companies more importantly, believe that their, uh, their technology is secure uh, when we do you know, manufacturing in Vietnam. Thank you for that. And uh, beside economic cooperation, equally as important is security cooperation. So with this new partnership, what can v Vietnam expect from the U.S. in terms of um, assistance to respond to China's aggression in the South China Sea? Well, one thing, and this is a key uh, tenet of the U.S. relationship with Vietnam, is that uh, we support a Vietnam uh, that's strong, independent, resilient, prosperous, um, and we respect Vietnam's sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, um, political system, and part and parcel of that is our cooperation over the years uh, to work on developing capabilities, particularly within Vietnam's Coast Guard, uh, to ensure that Vietnam has the capability to defend its interests at sea, but also in the air, on land, and in cyberspace. Uh, this Coast Guard cooperation to date has entailed uh, supplying, for example, three high endurance Coast Guard cutters. Uh, it's entailed supplying uh, 24 uh, patrol boats. It's entailed uh, building training and repair facilities for these Coast Guard assets. Uh, it's entailed um, sharing best practices and know how when it comes to monitoring and defending uh, maritime space. Um, and I expect this kind of cooperation to continue going forward. Um, in other areas, for example, we are working uh, to strengthen Vietnam's law enforcement capabilities, not just at sea, but also along the Mekong River, uh, to defend against um, wildlife trafficking or human trafficking, drug smuggling, you name it. Um, we are also uh, working with Vietnam to diversify its defense industry. Um, as we've seen um, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the supply of Russian equipment around the world is dwindling. Vietnam. Uh, wants to work with other countries um, around the world, including the United States, to diversify and modernize its 
uh, defense equipment and its defense production capability. And this is something American companies uh, and the U.S. government support and want to be a part of as Vietnam seeks to diversify uh, the defense equipment it, it has to defend its interests in the South China Sea. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Congressman Korea, yes. a cause dear to your heart is immigration. So just 48 years ago, the refugees started coming onto the U.S. shore in search of freedom. And today, two million Vietnamese Americans immigrants coexist in America, and we're trying to give back to the community every day. How would you respond to concerns that immigrants take away jobs from the U.S. workers and that our border is not secure? Thank you very much. Let's start out with history. When the Germans started coming here 200 years ago, there was a concern that Germans were taking jobs away. There was a concern that German would be the new language in America. The same arguments were made with every succeeding immigration group from Italians, Irish, Mexican Americans, and the same arguments today with the Vietnamese community. But let's, let's look at the facts. Let's look at little Saigon here. Orange County, you've taken an area of Orange County that was a sleepy community and really charged it up with a lot of economic activity. I would say you've added to the gross domestic product of Orange County. And today, if Orange County was to be a nation independent, we would be the 30th largest economy in the world. So uh, those are the stories mm -hmm. people hear about immigrants, uh, but immigrants are the lifeblood of this country. And I guess I look around and I think most of us are immigrants to this great nation. So I would say the contrary. America is built on immigrants. Mm -hmm. Hard work, intellect, we should welcome refugees to America. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ambassador, you particip participated in some of the uh, meetings with uh, President Biden and the leaders of Vietnam. Can you share with our viewers um, what were some of the most um, memorable moments? And last but not least, trust is an important factor in uh, building a new partnership. So specifically, what can Vietnam do to better foster that sense of mutual trust with the U.S. so that over time it can become a true strategic ally with the U.S. and not just an economic partner? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I thought Congressman Correa was going to get all the hard ones. <laughs> but, um, we saved one for you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of really memorable uh, moments from, from the President's visit to, to Hanoi. I mean, one of them was um, being in the motorcade, uh, traveling from the airport into town and around town and back out to the airport at the end of the visit. But just to see the thousands, tens of thousands of, of um, citizens of Hanoi coming into the street to, to you know, waving flags to welcome uh, the president to Vietnam uh, was very, uh, very special uh, to witness. And it really did show, I think, the warmth um, with which uh, the people there um, not just welcomed his visit in particular, but I think in general just welcomed a relationship with the United States um, and what it meant for the president to be there to upgrade, a double upgrade, um, you know, what that meant for the future of our two countries. Um, but a particularly moving moment um, was when uh, the president visited the National Assembly and there was the chairman of the National Assembly um, and um, they, the two leaders, uh, presided over a ceremony in which um, items from, from the war were exchanged between a group of American veterans and a Vietnamese veteran. And in fact, um, one of our veterans handed over to this Vietnamese veteran a diary uh, that had been his during the war. And just to see um, our leaders, uh, the president, um, standing there watching as these two veterans from formerly opposing enemy sides uh, to do this, exchanging items from the war was, was incredibly moving and an incredibly um, powerful message of reconciliation between our two countries. And for me, 
personally, um, you know, my father fought in Vietnam, uh, 1966-67. Um, he was with the Marines uh, north of Hue. He was an advisor uh, to an Arvin division, the 1st Infantry Division, and maybe some of your viewers or readers have some um, familiarity with that division or, or even relatives who might have fought with them. Please um, share with us your father's name. Um, Roger Knapper. He was Captain Roger Knapper. Um, um, but anyways, as, as the son of a veteran, um, to have gone in one generation from, you know, my dad fighting to now me serving as ambassador, I think is a powerful story about, about our, how far our two countries have come. Um, and it's certainly on me, it's an honor to serve as ambassador, as try to navigate uh, this important relationship um, for the United States. As for um, continuing to build trust and, and mutual understanding, I think um, one way to do it is through continued high-level visits. I think, um, you know, we're fortunate we've got um, the President of Vietnam, um, will, um, President Tuong will visit San Francisco for APEC in a few weeks. Uh, it was great. We had the Prime Minister of Vietnam, Phan Minh Ching, visited Washington shortly after President Biden's visit. So these kind of high-level interchanges, I think, are very important to building trust and friendship and understanding, continuing to build, I should say. Um, but also education, I think, is just so important. Um, getting Vietnamese students to the United States to study, to learn, even if it's a short program, two, three weeks, um, can be inspiring uh, for a young person to learn something about the U.S. And also, I want to see more um, Americans visiting Vietnam, not just as tourists, but as students, as teachers, uh, as researchers. I think it's, it's really, it's the young people building bridges and building understanding. It's their efforts that are going to be the foundation for taking our two countries' relationship to even the next level going forward. So I look forward to continuing to, to try and figure out how to get more young people going back and forth. I'm sure among your viewers uh, and, and audience, there are people thinking about going back to Vietnam, going to study. Um, I highly encourage it because I think really it's, it's going to be the responsibility of our young people, young Americans going forward, who are going to take this relationship to the next level. Thank you for that and for sharing your personal story about your father with our viewers. Congressman, I would like to pose the same question to you, but from the other angle. So what can the U.S. do to um, ensure that this new relationship with Vietnam will grow, will thrive, and will just be stronger? Thank you. Good, simple question. Yes. Um, the pieces are in place. Uh, COVID-19 has taught us that we can't rely on one specific country or source for our chips, for automobile parts. So we have to diversify from chips to critical minerals. And Vietnam, in many ways, fits that equation. So it's a natural. The challenge, in my opinion, is going to be to do the things that maybe we need to push on much harder. Human rights, religious freedom. We have to focus on those issues. Those are going to be uncomfortable issues, but the driver here is the Vietnamese community. The Vietnamese community in America have a vote, have a voice, and we need to make sure that they are listened to. You have loved ones in Vietnam. They are people that are still not enjoying freedom, either human rights or religious. Last night, I attended uh, a ceremony to celebrate the life of Bishop Brown, okay? Catholics, Vietnamese Catholics, Orange County. He passed on. He was a person that went to Vietnam many times to visit, to take care of the Catholic church in Vietnam, the relation. And I think he's leading by example, saying we can't forget those back in Vietnam. So the hard part has to be done. We must make sure that Vietnam does not forget that if you really want to be an economic powerhouse, if you want to move to the next level, you have to treat your citizens with respect and dignity. Thank you, Congressman. Before we wrap up, um, Mr. Ambassador, what's your impression of Hanoi? Anything that surprised you? Well, it's my second time living there. I uh, served in the U.S. Embassy um, from 2004 to 7, and I think um, 
and I had not been back in 15 years. And so to have gone back after a decade and a half, um, I was just impressed. I mean, the level of development, of course. I mean, the city is just growing and growing. But it still retains that, that essence of, of, um, of, of Hanoi, you know, and it's the season right now, you know, Luatu Hanoi, it's a very special time, the weather's changing, um, and so it's, uh, it's finally cooling down. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a comfortable, very livable city. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador and Congressman Korea. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your views in our broadcast regarding the issues that are top of mind for our viewers. We appreciate very much and we are honored to have you here today. And I'd like to thank you, our viewers, thank for joining in today and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina.